Harris, nice to see you. Hello, Alan. Nice to see you too. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Fantastic. Are you ready for some reliability rapid fire? Uh, yeah, let's go. All right. What do you mean so, rapid fire, by the way? Well, in, in the reliability rapid fire, what we're going to do is I've got two questions that I've prepared. They're not really questions. They're more statements about reliability. I'm going to fire, I'm going to fire a statement at you. Uh -huh. I'm going to give you a couple seconds to think about it, but not too long because it's rapid fire. And okay. then you're going to have five, five minutes to respond. And if I like your response, I'll just let you carry on. And if I don't like your response, I'm going to interrupt you. Then the bell is going to ring. Your time will be up. And then it'll be my turn to rebut what you said. Hopefully, you've got two questions for me as well. Well, now when I, when I see that you plan a very, very uh, total attack, I will attack back. <laughs> All right. The, the gloves are going to come off then. Okay. Is it time to take off the glasses? Not yet. <laughs> we can start with the glasses on, but if we got to roll up the sleeves. Exactly. It's time to go. It'll be go good time. Good. Harris, yeah, first then. question. First statement. Why adding too much grease makes bearing failure more likely? Go. First of all, because you kill the grease. So the bearing failure is the consequence of what you do with this. You kill the grease. Uh, by adding so much grease, making, making a bearing completely full, we stop the proper lubrication mechanism to, 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 to be in place. Because proper lubrication mechanisms means that there must be an empty space, a certain empty space in the bearing. First of all, empty space is needed to take away the heat. The second, the grease itself needs to move away from the, from the fighting area or war zone, as I, as I know that you like to call it. So if there is no space for grease to run away and bleed the oil out and create lubrication film, that means the grease will be everywhere, including the places it shouldn't be. Uh, as a consequence, we will have increased friction, we will have increased temperature. Uh, increased temperature definitely leads to speed up the uh, oxidation because temperature is a catalyst. And uh, as, as another consequence is that uh, uh, thickener will be chopped up completely, it will be destroyed. So it will not be able to perform the function as it should be functioning like a sponge, you know, that we use when, you, when we wash dishes or wash our body. So okay. it needs to have a nice fine structure to hold the oil inside. Now, if you chop it up like with a hammer, it doesn't have that ability anymore. So uh, most probably your oil will get out of the bearing because there's something holding it. It's gonna be, it's gonna be chopped up and those small pieces will get resol dissolved in oil. What happens with, uh, with, with, with any, any, any oil when you add foreign body, the viscosity will increase. So little by little, you are getting into this vortex of evil that one thing leads, leads, leads to another. And I, 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 I know that with many people say the more, the more the better. The more grease you put, the better it will roll, but it's, 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 it's not really the truth. Because, and then you have an additional thing that you can just picture it in your head very clearly. And if you are trying to run through the water, it's really fantastic athletic training, <laughs> but that's not what we want our bearings to do. So if, you, if, if, if these poor rotating elements are trying to fight their way through, through, the, through the grease, compacted grease, because there's no place to move, it simply increases the friction and stops the free motion. So does it kill bearings? First it killed grease, and then the grease kill, kills bearings. So it's a, it's a threat, it's a vortex of evil. One thing- But if you've got lots of additives, out. if you've got good additives in the grease, doesn't that, doesn't that help pre prevent that grease from dying then? It doesn't really matter if you've got additives. But you know, if you, if, you, if you really cook your meat badly, no matter how much spices you put, it will not taste good. <laughs> so the additives are there to help. Additives are not there to correct uh, a bad practice. So you cannot put that much additive to correct all the bad things that, that people do when they overgrease. The job of additives is not really to correct bad practice. It's to help, to enhance certain properties, to remove other properties, 
to add new properties to oil, but but not to <laughs> not to fight with oil lubrication. But if I, but if I'm, also need certain conditions to operate. But, but if I'm encountering high heat problems, I would think that by adding a lot more grease into there and packing it nice and tight, I should that should help me with my high heat problem. Well, maybe for few, for for first ten minutes. You put a nice cold grease inside. Now everything is rolling on a new cushion and it's quite silent. And for the moment, it's, uh, it's, it's, the temperature is going down, but very soon it will, it will go up back again. So adding more grease when it's over lubricated, it's not really a good idea. So you're, you're saying the opposite of what I believed, which is that grease can have a cooling effect. You're saying it can suffocate and, and make it overheat. But there's too much grease. The heat doesn't have a place to go. Yeah. So there must be there must be an empty space that to, to conduct that heat. Mm -hmm. So if it's everything is heavily compacted inside, the heat is trapped. And it will stay where it shouldn't be. It really pains me to say that makes sense. Because <laughs> it means yeah. I have to admit I'm admitting that you're I'm right. sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's <laughs> that's the fact. <laughs> Mm. That's the fact. So, so bad, bad practice is not something that we can resolve with additives. Bad practice is not something we can just close our eyes and that will go away or, or put our, our heads in the sand. Uh, you, know, you know what people say, too much is too much. Enough is enough. <laughs> so that's yeah. exactly what bearings are sometimes saying. Okay, stop it. Enough is enough. Because you are, you are, you are packing it up in, inside completely and it doesn't make sense. Okay. But that the rolling elements are actually flying nicely and gently on a thin layer of oil, not on the cushion of grease. Okay, so you made, it's my turn now, the bell rang. Um, so you made an analogy to running through water. And I, I can think of, I can think of back, back in university when we would sprain our ankle in um, playing basketball, our physiotherapy used to be to go into the shallow end of the pool, waist deep in water, and the water would make us buoyant and we would run in the pool. It's called running in the pool. I loved it because it wasn't near as hard as running on, <laughs> running on the ground. But now when I, when I, it was really a difficult job to run through four feet of water from one side of the pool and back to the four feet of water because I'm six foot seven. So I still had lots of, lots of mm -hmm. head space. But that was a really good way to um, build endurance, but it also burned a lot of energy. So if your bearings are churning through that thickener, they're not running efficiently. It's, it's yes, the, the, the motor is burning more energy. energy. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, if I contrast that to going for a jog, my favorite place to jog is on the nice sandy beach, ankle deep in water. Mm -hmm. I feel like I can run forever. I don't get tired. And, and the water's cooling me. And, yes. and it's just a little, it's just this little, so that's, that's really what we want to shoot for. Well, more or less, yes. If, if, if you think about a swimming pool and one side of the swimming pool is inclined and if there's just a little bit of water, you will just slide down without the ability to stop. If it's dry, it will not happen. If, if, the, if the swimming pool is completely full, it will not happen. So just the right amount of the, of the lubricating film is exactly what we need. Just, I, I know that people sometimes from the good intentions, they say, we'll put more. But <laughs> good intentions. You know, the, the road to hell is, is paved with the good intentions. So we have, here in Ontario and Canada, we have this thing called the, in the fall time, in, in October, we have what we call the country fair. Mm -hmm. And in the country fair, uh, you go and you have like Ferris wheels and, and all kinds of different rides and you go see the, the, the cows and the pigs and the sheep and, and the, and the, and the uh, border collie dogs and all that stuff. And you bring your kids there. And I can remember about 15 years ago, I was at the, uh, at the county fair with my, and my sons were waiting to go on a ride. And the ride operator jumped off of his station, jumped up onto the machine with a grease gun and started pumping and pumping. And this was one of those, it was just a, you sit in, you sit in a bench and it went mm -hmm. around and around and around. And this big main bearing, he went up there and he must, he must have put about a hundred shots of grease into that thing. 
And I don't know what his trigger was. I have no idea what alarmed him or made him think that he should go up there and put a hundred shots of grease blindly into that ride. But I can guarantee you one thing, my kids didn't go on that ride that day. Yeah, <laughs> but, but, you can, but you can also, you know, can also see one interesting thing here. It was certainly not the time shadow that forced him to jump there. I, I'm absolutely sure he didn't suddenly realize, oh, I have to lubricate now. No, he heard something, he saw something. So let's give him a little bit of credit there because he reacted well, on condition. We're gonna he give him- They noticed something. Or give him the benefit of the doubt. I don't know about credit. Okay, the benefit of the doubt, fair play, I agree. <laughs> it scared the heck out of me. I, we didn't go on that ride anyways. But then I thought it was an intro, I wish I had, back in that day, we didn't have nice phones on our camera, but if I had a phone on my camera, I would have been filming that because that would have been a perfect case study on what not to do when it, when it comes to lubrication. Yeah, I agree. I agree completely. Nice. Can I shoot you now with a question? Come on, bring it at me. Okay, so why is it important to find bearing failures early? Why it's important to find bearing failures early? Well, well we can talk about that one in a lot of different angles. You know. Sometimes people are concerned about the cost of the bearing, but you and I know that the cost of the bearing is really not uh, relevant to this formula at all. If it's a $50 bearing or a or $100 bearing or even a $1,000 bearing, none of, none of those prices have any bearing whatsoever on the true cost of a bearing when it fails unexpectedly. We are faced with unprecedented times right now. Every industry is being impacted by supply chain, logistics, being able to source OEM uh, parts, not hopefully counterfeit parts. And we need as big a window as possible, a big, and when I say a window, I mean a time window. I don't mean a window to look through, but I mean a window in which we can act through. And that window is, much more critical now than it was pre-pandemic, uh, pre-Ukrainian Russian conflict, all of, you know, and we can even go back pre-pandemic when we had the, the crisis in the Pan Panama Canal when the ship got turned sideways and that bunged everything up for, for months and months. We've, we're, we're in an unprecedented time and when a bearing fails, whether that bearing costs $100 or $1,000, it doesn't matter if we can't get our hands on one um, to replace it, then the costs just add up. So finding a bearing failure as early in the P to F curve as possible gives our procurement guys, and these procurement guys sh should get medals of honor right now. They should get purple hearts for what they're doing right now right. to make sure that we can keep our plants running. But the sooner that the condition monitoring team can come to them and say, hey, this bearing, is, this bearing is gonna fail. You need to start sourcing this thing. I've got six weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks. Well, what a luxury, six, eight, 10 weeks. That's quite a luxury three years ago. Right now, it's a, it's a crisis situation. Never mind if that bearing fails in an hour and you've got no time and you've got no redundancy and you've got no contingency plan built in. So it is important to find the bearing failure as early in the PDF curve as possible. And to do that, you need to have a failure modes and effects assessment on all of your ass, all of your critical assets and know, uh, and know exactly which bearing is in there or whether it's a seal or a coupling or whatever components there are so that you can get a line on those things and, and order them in as quickly as possible. Um, other reasons why uh, other reasons why we want to be able to catch bearing failures early is the labor. Um, there's a labor crisis right now. Uh, I don't know about in uh, in Europe or in a specifically where you are. In our part of the world, uh, we can't get people to come back to work right now. They they got laid off or they got they got terminated during the pandemic. We can't get enough labor to come back to work right now. So if I have a bearing fail tomorrow. I don't know who I don't know who's going to replace it. If I know that the bearing is going to fail in six or eight weeks, I can order it, and I can schedule that highly qualified labor to make sure uh, 
to make sure that I can get it repaired in a timely way. Does that help? Let me play a, a devil's advocate here. What we hear very often and uh, try to prove me wrong, try to prove, to prove them wrong actually, to people say, yeah, you're just telling me that, that something is dead. Mm -hmm. So how does that help? It's already dead. We cannot go back. So the damage is already there. And we have we have this kind this kind of uh, of people who are saying, well, yeah, it's it's dead. So you just told me that on Monday instead of instead of Friday. And obviously, obviously, this this is uh, the answer for this is what you said that having more time for supply chain and everything. I agree, but I want to ask another question: How are we? How are we? Can we? Can we make diagnosis sometimes where we can actually do something? Well, absolutely. You know, when it comes, if you want to talk specifically about bearing failures, yeah, we, we know that there's four stages of bearing failure. Although one clever guy told me there was five stages of bearing failure. The fifth one was silence. Hey, there goes the bell. Um, oh. we, can, we can definitely... Uh, we can definitely identify a bearing failure very early in the uh, failure curve with ultrasound. And that first stage of bearing failure has nothing to do with the physical bearing itself, but the lubrication mechanism. Because when the lubrication mechanism fails, the bearing has now entered failure, even though the bearing is still pristine, still in good condition. Now we can go in and we can act on that lubrication failure, we can remedy it, and we can save that bearing from going further down the failure curve. Is that what you're looking for? So let me see if I understood it well. So uh, finding it early and earlier and even more earlier means that you need to call a mortician, but you have three months time. But there is a moment when you can find it early enough to call a doctor instead of mortician. Or a lube tech. Yeah. Okay. For, okay. For a that's, nurse. that's that's an answer for my question. Thank you. I, li I like my hands better in the hands. I like my life better in the hands of a triage nurse than I do a doctor. Yeah. That, once you get once you get to the surgeon, you're already in trouble. <laughs> exactly. Well done. Well placed. Okay. My turn. Um, and I'm going to stick with lubrication because I know that that's the, <laughs> that's the biggest challenge we face right now. Why time-based greasing is no longer considered better practice. Can you give me five minutes to answer that? Only five minutes. You really don't like me. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let's put it this way. Let, let, me, let, me, let me say something which I don't say very often. Why not? Why not? Why wouldn't it be a great practice if you can be absolutely sure that you can calculate your time and quantity precisely. I have nothing against that. Mm -hmm. Because what, what, what I try to prescribe to people is also something based on time. Go and do the measurement. So the time-based greeting doesn't make much sense simply because we are not able to precise, precisely calculate the time. Quantity, more or less, but these two things are inevitably connected and interdependent. Uh, what I mean by not, not being able to calculate precisely is that there are so many parameters that impact and they are changing. So I'm always really very surprised when I see some recommendation on, uh, in some plant that says you need to lubricate after 3,265 hours. First of all, it's fascinating. It's really very, fascinating very to see specific. such a precise number. But then, then you have a much better situation when somebody says approximately 3,000 hours. That makes much more sense. At least yeah. you are saying, listen to me, guy. I'm not able to calculate it precisely, but this is more or less that. Now, the problem is that all these, all these correction factors, which are sometimes factor of 10, uh, looking at the certain parameters that are constantly changing. Hmm. So there's my favorite question. A question I always ask is, uh, what is the contamination in your bearing right now? 
There's no answer. Three. Uh, yeah, three. Three out of what? So there is exactly. a lot of question marks there, and nobody knows that. Yeah. Now, even if we somehow, by some miracle, manage to try to, to try to calculate that and then hope it's more or less correct, then you have another problem. Those parameters are constantly changing. Yeah. So if you have an exhaust fan which is sitting outside, the temperature will not be the same in the winter and summer. So that, that's one of the stupid points, but it's trivial, but it's, it's, it, it impacts lubrication. And then don't forget that uh, we can calculate something trying to consider that this machine is properly installed, this machine is properly balanced, this machine is properly aligned. Says who? In, in 60, 70% of the plants, you will find the opposite. So you can make your plan based on something, but reality is completely different. So instead of time-based lubrication, I'm also asking the question, there is a huge paradox in industry because there is a job that nobody knows if it needs to be done, we still do it. There is, no, there is a job that nobody knows how it needs to be done, we still do it. And there is a job that nobody, nobody knows what's the outcome and we still do it and that's lubrication. So by, by doing it based on time, we don't know what is the real need. Is there a need? We don't know how much. And we have no idea what is the out, out, outcome. So instead of that, three simple questions. Do you need grease? If yes, how much? And tell me, do you feel better now? It's quite simple and straightforward. How much? And do you feel better now? Yeah. Hmm. But, but, no, but not everybody has time for this. Nobody, not everybody knows where to get started in transitioning from a calendar-based schedule to a time-based schedule. And so uh, that's, the that's the first challenge I see. How, do, how can we help or how can we convince that it's worthwhile to make that transition? And then even if you can make the point to the guy or girl that's actually doing the task, how can you push that further up the further up the the the, uh, the line of command? How can you get approval at the higher level for to make that transition to a more precise lubrication? Because that's I a was, challenge I see. Well, I will start from up and then go down, not the other way around. So first of all, uh, we are talking about a solution, right? Condition based lubrication is a solution. Yep. If you want to implement a solution, there must be a problem. So if there is no problem, we should just go home, have a beer and go home. Yep. Why would we discuss any solution if the answer within the organization is we don't have problems? We have 10% downtime and we are okay with that. We change bearings every three months and we are okay with that. We still earn a lot of money. So you are talking to some very rich people and they don't have problems. So why would you discuss a solution at all? What I'm trying to, to trivialize here is that first, there must be a definition of the problem. Do you have a problem? If somebody says, I don't have any problems, that's close to crazy. So that just means that, 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 that the reality is not properly presented to the decision makers. So and, we say about that person that they're in denial. Yes, yes. It's more or less like a drug addict. I agree. So there must be a problem. Once the problem is defined, I never in my life, I've never seen a management who, who says, okay, now I see the problem and I'll, I will let it keep on happening. There is no manager in the world who will do that. If so we have, know, to, that's we have to turn that manager into an advocate. Absolutely. Turn him into advocate. Show the fact and say, okay, this is the problem. And the job of any leader will to find a solution is to find a solution on the problem. But why would anyone look for the solution if, if the problem is not defined? And then, and then I will now answer your first part of the question, how to make a transition. So if you're talking about, about an organization who is doing diligent uh, time-based uh, uh, greasing, so that means that are disciplined, obviously. This is the part I like. They are disciplined, they go out and do some things on the time schedule. Perfect. Keep on doing it. Just don't push grease. Instead of going out to grease, 
go out there to measure. So it's actually painless transition. Painless transition. You just go on, keep on going, do it on the shadow, just don't push grease. Take the measurement and if necessary, push grease and your ultrasound device will tell you how much. So I don't see a big, big tectonic uh, disturbance in his daily routine. Some people can say, uh, yeah, but I, but I use more, more time. Instead of uh, 28 seconds, I need 57 seconds. Well, if your if value of your 26 seconds is much higher than three days of downtime, then somebody's paying you too much. But you can't just go and turn a lubricator, a, lubricator, a, a grease monkey. You can't just expect him to go out there and become a condition monitoring uh, analyst. Why not? Tell me. Why, why wouldn't I expect that? As so a po- condition, po- because it, condition monitoring, it's, it's a deep and mysterious subject with lots of complexities and a huge learning curve. But last, can't time, just... last time I checked, nobody was, was born as a condition monitoring expert. So they learned, right? So yeah. as a Napoleon said, in a, in a bag of every soldier, there's a martial stick. So everybody can become a marshal. Everybody can become a president. It's his, his, his uh, constitutional right. So what's the problem with the grease guy or grease monkey, as they call them in some very, very bad organizations? What's the problem with him becoming, becoming a condition monitoring triage or nurse or even expert? I'm all, I'm all for it if it can be done quickly and it, and it doesn't take years for him to, get to, to uh, obtain the experience that he needs to do it. Can you propose a way for Three him days. to do it quickly? Three days. Three days. Three days. On the need to know basis. This is what you need to know. And it's much more than you, than you actually than you need. If you want to know more, more than welcome. But in three days, he can become an expert. So you're saying that we can, we can take a time-based greasing and we can, we can replace time-based greasing with a condition-based greasing as a better practice and I don't have to hire new people. I can use the lubrication technician that I already have and just train him to be a condition monitoring guy. Yes, uh, I know the bell rang, but let me answer this one. You touch the pain point with this question. I don't need to hire new people. That's why this we're here. Is, this is what people do when they are building the improvement. So suddenly uh, they realize, oh my God, my lubrication practice is a complete tragedy. I'm aware of it now. And the first thing they do, they fire all the people they hire in you guys. What, what injustice is that? Catastrophe, it's a human disaster. So for years you were neglecting these people you never gave them any training, any chance, any opportunity. And now, and they waited patiently and they did the job. Mm. Good or bad, but they did the job. They were there. And now when you want to invest something finally, you said, you guys, you are not good for that. I'll get a new guys. Mm. No, 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 no. You just touched the pain point. I'm sorry. I get a little bit emotional. My friend, that that's chance, why we're here. That's that why chance, we're here. That chance needs to be given to those guys. Yeah. If they say, no, boss, I'm not interested. I'm not a learner. I hate this job. I don't want to do that. Okay, okay. fine. You are now morally clear. He doesn't want that. Let him go. But we need to give those people a chance. Because don't forget, they know everything. They know the, the organization, machines. They know everybody. The, the best possible material. And they deserve a chance. And they're the most intimately connected with the machines. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So you just change okay. the practice, not people. Okay. We can talk about this one for a lot more than five or 10 minutes by the sounds of yeah. it. But, uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm on board with you. Yeah. Now, can I, can I shoot at you now? Let's change, let's change the topic. Go okay. ahead. So, so now we have a, 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 a driver. We have a nice, beautiful lubricated bearings that we will find the problems early. Yep. Everything works nice, everybody happy, but how to anticipate shaft coupling failure before they happen? Because that power needs to be transmitted. Uh-huh. There you go. So we got a motor, 
we've got a pump. And the only way that motor can drive that pump with their beautifully lubricated bearings is if those shaft, if that shaft gets coupled. Exactly. Lo lots of different ways to couple that shaft. We've got offsets or cardon shafts. We've got, um, which need to be lubricated. We've got flexible couplings, which are supposedly there to take, to tolerate some level of misalignment. Uh, we've got grid couplings, which again, need to be lubricated. Um, and we've just taken our lube technician and we've trained him how to be a condition monitoring specialist as well. So now he can go out there and he can touch his probe on the motor bearing, touch his probe on the pump bearing and tell us that they're in good condition or they need grease or they need maintenance or what have you. But if he touches his probe on the flexible coupling, he's gonna have a problem because the cable is going to get wrapped around the shaft and he's going to, he's, he's going to do a lot of damage. And so, then you need a new technician. Yeah, and you need a new technician and probably a new data collector and a new cable and a new sensor. And you've got downtime. But we have to have a way, there has to be a strategy to anticipate shaft coupling failures before they happen. And luckily there is, I had it sitting here yesterday, but someone's put it away. It's this lovely little, oh, I see it over there. I'll be right back. It's this lovely little sensor that we can safely insert into the coupling guard so we don't have to expose anybody to any kind of danger at all. So I have a nice foam, rubber grip on the end so I won't slip out of my hand unless I let it go. At this end, I have an airborne ultrasound sensor that reads exactly the same as my contact sensor mm -hmm. and a cable to connect into my data collector. And so now after I'm done collecting my ultrasound readings on my bearings, there's nothing that prevents me from coming up and inserting this through an access point in my coupling guard. And now I can bend it a little bit and I can manipulate it so that it's nice and close to the coupling. And by airborne, I'm going to receive an ultrasonic signal that I can measure with my four condition indicators. I can trend it by capturing a dynamic signal and looking at it in the time domain I can even take it into the, into the spectrum and look and see if I've got coupling misalignment, because if I see coupling misalignment, then I'm gonna see repet repetitions of the, of the shaft frequency in, uh, in my FFT. So all of these things can be done without having to contact the coupling physically, without having to expose my hand to any kind of danger. And if I do, just ha so happen to touch the coupling by accident and damage my sensor. Well, the nice thing is, is I can just unscrew it, throw it away, go to stores and screw a new one on. And I guarantee you that the new one that I screw on here is going to read within a half a decibel to one decibel of the previous sensor that I just destroyed. So that is, what we, we teach them to not only go collect the uh, data on the bearings, but also at the same time as part of their condition monitoring route to pull some data off the coupling. So if I understand you well, you are, it's like an invitation, go take a listen. So go coupling listen. is there, you are there, why don't you just take a listen? Did I, did I understand you well? That's exactly, that's exactly how it works. But now it's not just a matter of go have a listen. We've actually built this in now so that it's part of the, it's part of the uh, procedure. If you're checking the bearings on the motor, if you're checking the bearings on the pump, if you're checking the bearings on the fan, you're also going to check the coupling. Okay, who can do that? Who is the okay. candidate? Who are the candidates to do that? Anybody who's been through those three days or less of training that you talked about in our, in our previous topic. This is, uh, this is not complicated stuff. It's not difficult to do. 
it's it's a single point task. You you make a you make a visual observation that the asset's safe to approach, that the safe that, that the guard is safely attached, that, and that you have a small access hole of say 20 millimeters. That's all mm -hmm. you need to get the sensor through there. In um, on your data collector, you're going to set an acquisition signal of say, but depending on the rotation on the shaft rotation, but I'm most of, most of these motors, if you grab three to five seconds, uh, you're going to have enough time there to have a good RMS. Uh, you're also going to have five seconds worth of data to look in the time waveform. <sighs> Who's going to do it? it? It really does not require a cat two or a cat three vibe analyst to go out and do this. Anybody can go out and collect that data. And I would even, I would even wager that you don't need to be a cat three vibe analyst to make, to look at the time waveform and do an, do an assessment on the coupling. So that means not only I will find a problem, uh, but I will also save a lot of highly valuable time with my, my specialist for something else. Am I correct? Well, this is the biggest, this is the biggest problem that you and I talked about in our, in our last conversation is there's always, there's always more of them and there's never enough of us and them being defects and us being specialists to, uh, to assess them. So, yeah, if I'm one of those reliability departments that's so fortunate to have you know, that, uh, that high level vibration analyst on staff, I sure don't want to waste his time assessing, first of all, assessing things that aren't in a failed condition to begin with. And second of all, to be assessing things that can easily be assessed by uh, a level one ultrasound specialist. Which by the way, I saw you, uh, you created a bunch more of them last week. Mm -hmm. Well done. Cool well done. Yeah, well done to them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm happy to say that after these four shots in this rapid fire, yep. nobody got hurt. Wow. Except, the, is, bad except the bad practice. That is, that is the beauty of being able to communicate uh, across the Atlantic Ocean and the Adriatic Sea. Yeah, <laughs> I have long arms, but they're not that long. <laughs> yeah, well, I can always cover myself. <laughs> yeah, but if if we did some damage to uh, to a bad practice, then I'm really happy. And uh, these fast questions and fast answers, I thank you for this for this uh, idea because it's a really really good way to shoot. Because uh, this is this is actually what what needs to be done in industry. Yeah. Put the problem on a table and, and, and give me a solution in five minutes. At least make me interested in five minutes and then we'll talk more. I agree. We, we, had, we, had, four, we had four statements and we kind of yeah. covered three topics. Why adding, why adding too much grease makes bearing failures more likely. Why it is important to find bearing failures early. Definitely. Why time-based greasing is no longer considered better practice and how to anticipate shaft coupling failures before they happen. These are all three great, um, these are three great topics for great statements that should really fuel the imaginations of the audience for this, um, for this motion drives uh, topic that, we're, that we're, we were asked to speak to, don't you think? Absolutely, so, so if the outcome is to say, okay, uh, I heard these four statements and uh, I ask myself, what am I doing? If I'm doing at least one of them wrong or not good enough, there is a very good topic to, to continue discussing it and to polish this practice up to perfection. Beautiful. And I think, and I believe that the organizers of this great conference have left, has left uh, 15, 20 or 30 minutes for some question and answer on these topics. So um, yeah. I'm more than happy to stick around and, and answer these to those to the best that I can. And um, right. so let's, let's turn over to that Q and A now. Right. Between you and me, see you next time over the Atlantic. <laughs> I can't wait. I can't wait to actually be sitting in the same room with you, Harris. Me too. All right. Take see care. Bye-bye. Stay well.